You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. Hey guys, this is Brian Lenny of Mining Stock Education and Junior Stock Review. Uh, today with me, I have Derek McPherson, uh, former mining analyst and now CEO of two publicly traded companies, Gold 79 Mines and all of Resource Capital. Derek, it's great to have you. And I think since you're uh, a new guest to the show, if you could start off by Nitro uh, with on yourself. Sure. Thanks, Brian. So yeah, as you mentioned, I am a mining analyst. And, and, and as you know, Brian, uh, once upon a time, we both had real jobs. We both worked as uh, engineers at a, at a steel factory together. Um, so I'm a metallurgist by background. Uh, went uh, after my MBA, started working in mining research, worked in mining research for 10 years, worked as an investment banker towards the end. And then after... Um, and after that, uh, at the end of that period, I was one of the, the early employees at Red Cloud and helped build that business. And then when I left, I joined uh, Gold 79 Mines as, as president CEO, um, which is a gold explorer in the Southwest US, which we've been advancing, um, which is a bit, which is done well technically, but is suffering from the markets. And then additionally, uh, myself and uh, my business partner, Sam Pelez, we took over a, a public listed investment issuer that's now called all of resource capital and, and uh all effectively what a public listed investment issuer is, is all of is a, a publicly listed corporation that invests in uh other companies and we invest primarily in uh in, in resource stocks excellent um you were in beaver creek a couple of weeks ago you know for those that don't know beaver creek or uh the precious metal summit is uh, you know in my opinion one of the best conferences to attend as a as an investor and I think on the company side of things too. So could you give us your perspective of the event and you know what sentiment was like and such? Yeah, I, I, I was actually at the Denver Gold Forum as well, which is, you know, is the, 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 so Beaver Creek is the small cap side and Denver Gold Forum is the large cap side. I think both are sort of both are important at, you know, the, the precious metal summit, I think there was, um, generally speaking, there's a surprising amount of optimism. Um, and I think there's a lot of people that are comparing, and we can get into this later, but a lot of people comparing right now to sort of, you know, 2015, w- where the sentiment was so bad. And then there was, I mean, there was a hard rally into 2016, but I, I think generally speaking, you know, one of the couple things I took away, there wasn't a lot, there weren't a, a huge number of funds there that had a lot of capital to deploy, um, more corp dev and which fresh file summit has become very much. So there's a lot of corp devs, a lot of companies out there looking that'll feed into my comment about the Denver gold forum. Um, but you know, I think it was more optimistic than you'd expect based on the share prices and balance sheets of a lot of the junior explorers that were the are the primary thing there. But you know, there are there definitely were bright spots and companies that I saw that were um, very uh, you know things that I didn't know about before. Which you know, I've spent my whole life sort of covering junior mining stocks, and you know, you just run into things that you just hadn't seen. And I think that was that's the whole reason you go, right? I mean, you don't go to see the same 10 stories that you've known your whole career is to, to go see those new things. And so that for me was very interesting. Um, so I think that from Precious Metal Summit, that was there. Going on to Denver, Denver was very interesting for us. So one of the things, uh, you know, w- with our, the way we distribute our portfolios, we invest in large caps and we invest in small caps. Um, and so we just basically, you know, at the Denver Gold Forum, which is effectively where all the large companies present, we sit through the major mid-tier presentations just to understand where they're at, what they're thinking. You know, and you can get some insight out of that. Like, you know, last year, one of our big conclusions was that nobody was going to buy anything except B2, who basically said straight up, we're going to buy something. And it turns out they did. They bought, they bought Sabina. Other guys have bought stuff. It's not like it's unique, but there is a, uh, th- there is an interesting, um, you do learn something from that, right? Um, the thing, and the other thing that really stood out to me last year and the theme was repeated again this year um even though the gold price has been really high and a lot of these majors and mid-tiers have really strong balance sheets is that um you know they're the majors in particular are trying to run themselves like businesses um i think this is a function of you know the you have a situation where there used to be a premium like when you and i started in the business gold companies had a premium multiple relative to their base metal peers um, and that's completely eroded. And I think that's because, you know, you used to have to buy gold. You used to have to buy Barrick or, or Newmont to get gold exposure. Now you can buy the GLD or the GDX or the GDXJ. You don't, you don't take on the same liquidity risk. You don't take on the single company risk, you know, and from a risk adjusted basis, you can get better returns on, 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 on gold. And so now all of a sudden these guys have to sit down and distinguish themselves as businesses. And so they're sort of approaching it that way. Um, so you know a lot of the majors weren't uh very you know there was very little discussion about m a 
But the, the thing that really jumped out at me, they're all, you know, sort of paying good size, you know, good dividends or decent dividends. They're all buying back stock aggressively. And then if you look down, if you look below the majors into the mid tiers, like the the Dundies, the Santeras of the world, they have really some of them have really strong balance sheets. So, you know, Dundee is almost a third of its market cap in cash, no debt, right? Like, you know, so these are companies that, yeah, they, you know, they have an interesting exploration project, but they have a little larga, but they're, you know, they're in a position to actually do something and put their balance sheet to work. Um, and so that was something that really, uh, I guess, jumped out at us um, this time is that, you know, I guess probably the going back full circle on that 2015 to 2016 thing, 2015 the balance sheets were not in good shape, right? This was a the sector was, you know, we we're talking about sub $1,200 gold and $1,900 gold. A lot of these good producers are, are minting it for, for lack of a better, <laughs> lack of a better description. Yeah, it was, so let's let's carry on with that final thought you were kind of discussing there. You know, balance sheets do look really good for those senior mid tier producers, and a lot of companies are sitting on you know big swaths of cash. And you know, the mining industry is constantly needing to replenish their coffers for for future development. What do you think is going to be the catalyst to get that cash put into M and A, and for us to see that kind of M and A spree that we maybe all have been dreaming of, but still hasn't happened? Yeah, we get it. We get it in pockets. Like you get, like you know, in January, you know, a lot in January every year. There's those one or two deals that everyone gets gets excited about. But yeah, you're right. There hasn't been that like, okay, just stop, start, just stuff starts getting steadily picked off. Um, I think the you know, oddly enough, you need the sentiment change, right? If you look at past M and A cycles and what's happened, a lot of the a lot of the executives and C suites they get crucified in a bad market in a in a, in a poor sentiment market because I wouldn't describe for the meteors majors you're not in a bad market right you're in a market where you're getting where you're ma- making a lot of money but you get a there's a lot of pushback when you start doing M and A in a bad in in a, in a poor sentiment market um, so when that sentiment changes is when M and A picks up the other thing is and this is the other challenge is that all the you know it takes two it takes two to tango right so. The on the other side of that, a lot of juniors are looking at it, going, "I'm the cheapest I have ever been. Like, why, why on earth would I sell at the 52 week low?" And and a lot of them want, you know, 50 to 100 percent premiums. And guys are like, you know, people don't want to pay that. You know, Bristol's famous for like, you know, we're going to do everything at market. Well, you're not going to get a you're not going to get a a, a mid tier developer, you know, a, a developer with a 200 thousand ounce a year asset at, at in these markets at at a at market deal, right? You're going to have to pay a premium to get it. Um, and probably much, pretty much above average. Um, we just did, we, uh, we did some work, uh, when we sold, uh, our big investment, uh, which was rock clip, uh, to HUD Bay. And we did some work on what average premiums are and average premiums for sort of junior explorer and junior developers are like 50%. If you look at it over time, over a long period of time, yeah, you get these odd ones that are a hundred plus and you get the sort of the standard 30, but it's 50% is the number. And, and, and it, I think that's where you have to. You know, that's w- what guys are looking for, and so you know it's hard for management teams to get. If you're the buyer, it's hard for a management team to get over the line and say, "Ah, yeah, we're going to pay fifty percent for that. We love it that much, fifty percent higher for that." And it's hard for the you know the the seller to say, "Okay, yeah, we're only going to take twenty five percent above our fifty two week low to 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 transact this asset, right?" Because oftentimes, when you're a developer going into a, into a, a mid tier or major, you don't get that same or that your asset brings to it, right? So if I understand you correctly, then it's kind of has to be be good on both sides of the coin. Even though it looks good for the senior senior producers right now, it doesn't look good for the juniors. And therefore, the juniors don't want to give up that value that they see in their projects until there's more recognition, you know, to the till we see the market get back into the junior equities and there's kind of that symbiotic um, yeah. relationship going forward. I, I, I will tell you, yeah, m a is hard, right? You have <laughs> to get you have to get two parties to agree on something. Um, and yeah, not only do you have to get, you know, you got to get, you know, in, a, in a, the case of a big company, you have to get the, the two CEOs to agree on it. Then, you know, the bigger company has to get his all his corp dev team to bob their head up and down. And then he's got to get his board, which is probably six or seven people. The junior side, you got the CEO, and he's got a five or six person board that he's got to agree. Probably he's going to go to a couple of his big shareholders and say, listen, what do you think? Like, we'll all cross them and say, this is the opportunity. So like, it, it's, uh, you know, it, is like... It, but I guess I would describe it as probably hurting chickens is easier than doing M&A, just simply because of the the nature of, of how many people you need to sort of convince and, and bother their head up and down. And I, I think that's why you don't see more of it even, you know, 
even though logically on paper, a lot of it makes sense. That's why you don't see more of me. So, you know, you talked about sentiment and, you know, how sentiment has to change. And so I guess my question for you right now is what do you think is going to be that, that catalyst or thing that turns sentiment? Is it the fact that, you know, valuations are low and the cure for low prices is low prices? Or are we going to have to see that big catalytic event, whether that, you know, that's, you know, market crash or, or something that sends the gold price, you know, well beyond where, you know, the, the highest, you know, 2100, is that what needs to happen to, to spur sentiment in the sector? I, I don't think those are mutually exclusive, but you just described there. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, everyone has been waiting for a recession. Uh, it's the recession. It's the most telegraph recession of all time that has ever come. Um, now they're talking about soft landing again. The Fed just came out and that while it did raise rates, they said they might raise rates again. We're going there to a presidential year. My uh, Sam and I had the discussion 10 minutes ago, or 10 minutes ago and we have it all the time. Uh, Sam is the president CEO of all of these, the, the CIO as well. But um, we had this discussion all the time about you know where, where the Fed is and what they're going to do. And we're going to a presidential next year. So my view is the raising rates again is going to be a a a tough thing for the fed to do now doesn't mean they don't do it but it just it could be a tough thing for them to do um you know i think you need a bit more of that washout trade we've sort of been waiting um we just got uh we just got very liquid in our fund um at the sailor rock cliff and because of that we're just kind of sitting on our hands because we we're kind of waiting for that moment of something has got to happen to change change the tide and i think it, it in our view is it's down before up um also you know there's, there's lots of reasons not to, to buy the fourth quarter of the year but the the um but the, the move is down and up but then i think your comment about you know when you get that washout trade you know the sentiment broadly goes negative the first thing that reacts generally out of those washout trades is gold right everyone goes i'm like gold i need to get exposure and so you're and then all of a sudden gold does exactly what you said you get that 2200 dollar moves um you know you get a move from 1900 to 2200 2200 i you know again that comparison 2015 2016 it's not perfect but 2015 2016 the gold price only moved 20 percent. right you, if you think about that in perspective you know to the highs were 25 percent move to the highs not even and then all of a sudden you know xyz code you name it it doubled right like nico doubled kid ross doubled right like forget about like you know, small your small cap juniors that did three or four times on no news. So it was there was you have big cap companies that that had had you know hundred you get hundred percent gains on. So I think that that's the but you need that. You know, it's it's going this way, but it's got to go this way first, right? It's <laughs> you know, and I, and I and that's kind of our view, and that's why we're being very cautious on how we're how we're deploying our newfound uh, liquidity. Right. Okay. So you have some liquidity. You're you're sort of sitting on your hands your hands like you say. What are you looking for? Where do you think the opportunity is in this kind of market? I, that's a great question. Um, you know, in this market, I think there's there's a couple things. Um, you know, the, the beauty of a market like this, um, which is probably an odd way to describe this market, is beautiful. But the beauty of a market like this is that you can get into situations where, like, you get significant price dislocations. Something has happened to the company. There is a a, a news flow item that is out there, but no one's paying attention, and it, there's a dislocation. We're, just, you know, I'll, 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 I'll give you an example of a trade where we're in the process of exiting, and I'll talk about sort of the, the things. But like, um, we're we were um, we ended up buying a, a company called Selfish Royalty. Selfish Royalty was trade around 80, 85 cents. Uh, what happened? There, there was some. Uh, they have a private royalty that they described no value in, in the share price to the you know the private owner had filed the BLM operating permit. So there's you know that all of a sudden there's a mine moving forward it's in the public domain as to what scale generally looks like um so there's a catalyst out there additionally it's a it is a majority uh the way they've structured it, it's a majority silver so it was going to get picked up in the silver etf here at the beginning of september so you got a couple of catalysts they're trading catalysts and it's tightly held so that that would move the stock and so the stock went from 85 to almost about 40 in a three-month span right and that i mean those are perfect catalyst it's a good company it's got a backstop valuation you know i mean everything can go down but you've got a backstop valuation and then you get an opportunity but you know the market isn't out looking for deals so they no one's out looking you know okay the blm filings are out there or talking to management saying yeah hey the blf filings are out there you could go look at see what this slide's going to look like and that you know it's a, 
and, and, and the stock moves. Um, so I think there's you, you, there's opportunities. And that was, you know, we made a you know pretty healthy 50, 60% return in three months. So you, you could do that a few times a year. You're, you're doing great. Um, but I think the, you know, where you got to look, Mark discoveries are missed by the market, right? You can see you see companies with really good drill holes and they go up like ten percent. Um, you know, you see it across the board. Um, world class drill holes, not just you know, okay, that's a good hole, but world class drill holes and then stocks trade sideways or down, or they're only up ten percent. Where in a real market, they'd be up a hundred, right? Um, you know, you've got management teams that are creating value and de-risking projects, but it, you know, I mean, part of that is not getting part of that's not getting deep appreciated by the market, but they're. I mean, generally those things often don't, you know, they have less value, but you've got, you know, they've moved a project ahead materially, but the valuation hasn't changed, right? That's kind of the, the, the there's opportunities there because no one's paying attention. No one's looking for, looking for a deal. Um, and, and so those are the things that you kind of like, okay, you know, obviously you got to do your screen management and balance sheet and, and, and those, those basics, but then you go, okay, where's, where are the opportunities in this market? What is, where is something that has maybe a backstop value where it is, right? What, as it, you know, something has happened that has changed the story. Market hasn't really recognized it yet. And then, you know, obviously the question is when will the market recognize it? Because you get you get the value. But will it recognize? And those are things that we're kind of looking at is like, okay, let's let's start to, you know, step in. And w- what we'll do is we'll step in cautiously, kind of this time of year, quarter position level. And then as if there's a, and then add on weakness to, to slowly, to slowly build a position, because I think those are, those are kind of the opportunities. Um, the other thing is though, and I think, the, so that's the, the junior side, but the other thing is, is that you don't have to take junior mining risk to have a double between now and, 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 in in junior January or, or, or June next year. Right. Like, um, there's like one of the positions that we hold on the large cap side is going for. Right, Glencore trades at three times EBITDA. Um, it's a stock that, just as for reference, it more than doubled on the, that, that 15, 16 trend coming out of the trough. But you can look at the big caps like Freeport or First Quantum or Tech, and they often do these two or three times moves out of out of troughs. Right, where she, which is where we are. Um, you know, it just it did some great deals in 2019 2020 early 2020 on coal assets which turned out to be brilliant i mean they cash flowed what they paid for them in the in the first few months um and it's a commodity trader so there aren't a lot of public listed commodity traders and that's something that people don't quite a lot of people don't recognize um you know like trafigura or or a lot of them are brought more way it's public in, in japan but a lot of them are, are privately held because they are such good businesses, right? They don't they don't need access to capital because they generate so much. So a commodity trader like Glencore is like a is almost like a it's a fourteen percent royalty, right? They're they're clipping out, out of the top of the you know they're buying concentrate and shipping it over here. So yeah, they're taking some risk in the interim, but they're making a fat margin for that little bit of risk. Um, and so there's a um, there's a there's a, there's an opportunity. Anyways, so those are you know there's opportunities on the there's opportunities on the small cap side, but there's opportunities on the on on the large cap side as well. So you know, you talk about those opportunities and drill results. Does the metal matter to you, or are you agnostic? I mean, generally speaking, as a as a fund, we invest in it and in any in any commodity, right? Uh, any resource. Um, so everything from gold to fertilizers um, and oil. Um, but yes and no, I think is the is the short answer on on does the commodity matter? Yeah, it, like you know, uh, for a gold hole to matter it has to be beyond spectacular right now or in australia one of those listed in australia one of those two things um for a um for a copper hole to matter i think there's a lot slightly lower hurdle rate um for a lithium hole to matter there's an even lower hurdle rate for a uranium hole to matter probably even lower than that before it actually moves the stock um so i think there's you know you want to look at that as part of it but like you know would you look at you know, uh, a a bad example and a good example is uh, uh, Southern Cross in uh, in Victoria, right? The drill four hundred meters, five grams gold, massive hole. Um, yeah, it is thirteen zones, and they 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 they, they lay it out really well in the press releases exactly what they hit. But you know, and that stock moved, but it's in Australia, so it moved. But I think that the, the you know holes like that, you know, those are spectacular holes. Those are things like 
but you know, those are holes like that are what Great Bear was built on, right? Like when people you look at at sentiment and what can what can move a stock. So there certainly is a di- there's a dislocation, but I don't think that stock moved as much as it should should have based on that based on that hole. I hold that company's still 150 million market cap, right? And it's not like this is that this is the first hole and they just hit it. It went from 10 to 150. It's you know this is they're starting to find a pretty sizable zone and they've got step up potential. So it's things like that where you get that like that opportunity um, that I think are that you know but doesn't have to be commodity specific right i we've seen good copper holes not get re- not get rewarded uh very recently um as well so you know that as a as a it's a challenge as an investor if you're already invested there because obviously you expected this you you invested for that drill hole and they expected the stock to go up but as someone who's looking to you know sort of maybe redeploy some capital or look at you know repositioning your portfolio you look at those opportunities and go, okay, well, that's a, you know, we like the management team. We like the, we like the location, you know, the drill hole is good. Market didn't recognize it. That's the opportunity, right? Then you, you can, you, 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 you can reposition to, into stuff like that. How would you describe where we are on the spectrum of risk? You know, valuations are, are low, you, you know, pretty much across the, the market. Um, but there's definitely things going on in the world that make you kind of wonder. So where would you describe our, where we are on the spectrum of risk? That's, that's an interesting question. I right. mean, we are talking about mining equities. So we're at the yeah. highest spectrum of risk, regardless. Rega- um, yeah. So it's, it, that's a level. You, I think you got to preface that always, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. oh yeah, no, it's a low risk trade now. <laughs> um, no, it's a high risk trade always, always. Uh, where we are in that spectrum of high risk yeah. um, is where the question is, I think that you could buy. Like you can buy ounces to the ground for five dollars an ounce right now, and not, you know, in a in the in the in the junior mining space. And that's you know that's a proven forty three one hundred one resource in a in a good jurisdiction. So you know there is it is it feels lower risk now. Feeling lower risk and being lower risk are two different things, right? Obviously, stocks can still go down, right? Where it's September, uh, we're recording this on September twenty sixth. You know, tax loss selling is coming. There is a look. There is a there is a leg down, probably for a lot of these stocks, going into the end of the year. Um, it's been three years of tax loss selling in a row, so I don't know how much <laughs> who's got who got needs to <laughs> yeah. to protect. But the you know, so there is that risk. Um, obviously, that we talked about the recession risk, and we're starting to see those things kind of play out. The U.S. dollar is continuing to strengthen; it's putting pressure across the world, but. Yeah, I think there's there you know there is maybe the right way to describe it instead of risk is we're closer to the bottom than top is the is the thing and and, and no one's ever going to pick the bottom I, I don't think you know some people claim that they're smart enough to do that I, I know I'm not um, but we are definitely closer to the bottom than the top so that's why you're you're comfortable saying okay well if we pursue something if we go after something now that we think is you know that we think is really attractive has some of those you know things that have been missed by the market or it are you know filled into the valuation or you're you're buying a resource in a good jurisdiction for five dollars an ounce and you know it's the kind of resource that that gets developed in a good market um you know i think that there's those types of um opportunities you can be comfortable starting to dip your toe in the water right like not you know i wouldn't race out there and okay yeah I, you know five dollars an ounce go you know, build a full position right now, you know, move the stock up so that you can get, get your fill, right? Like that's you, the sellers will come to you. Uh, it's kind of the way this market has sort of, um, been set up. So, you know, I think, but I think that's part of the opportunity as well. So we've talked about risk. We've talked about, you know, the valuations of some of the companies. Now let's parlay it to jurisdictional risk. Can a company at this point, um, you know, show good value, you know, we, we've got the the talk about risk. Does jurisdictional risk become less of a, of an item if the valuation is low for you? There are different kinds of risks that you take all the time, right? Each jurisdiction, it, uh, what we've learned um, uh, over time is that each jurisdiction has its own risk, right? Like, you know, there are, um, you know, if you, if you want to look at, you know, the U.S., right? Yes, you're probably not going to get your asset taken away, but you're at a permitting timeline. If you're in, uh, you know, Ecuador or, or Peru, if all of a sudden there, you, you you run the risk of mining law changes. You you know, Peru's got the worst of it because they got permitting timeline, long permitting timelines, and you know, um, risk changes right now. But I think 
you know, but there's different risks, right? Like, you know, Mexico used to be the, the go-to place because it was lower, you know, pretty stable mining law, six months to get permits kind of, kind of thing. And now, you know, that's obviously a little bit in, I think, I think you need to account that jurisdictional risk you need to account for, but it also depends on commodity, right? I think in sort of the green metal space, or so you're talking about uranium or copper, or, or I guess people call it critical, the, the, the government tagline is critical minerals. I think that their jurisdiction risk really matters there, right? You you have a, 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 we're going through a period now where you're having the global supply chain is decoupling, right? You, you know, and because the global supply chain is decoupling, everyone is looking around and figured out that China controls, you know, I think the metal they control the least is copper. They have 60% of the world's copper flows through China, right? So if you start thinking about it in terms like that, you go, okay, there's a decoupling. So there's, you know, that, that onshoring or reshoring of, of commodity production, right? Or, and so the controls into sort of Western allies, um, I guess, you know, they won't, no one will say it out loud, but we're, you know, it seems like we're on the start of a start of a new cold war. There's the sort of the emerging markets, Russia and China against, you know, the older Western economies in, you know, Canada, the U S Europe, um, mostly the U S. Um, and I think that that, decoupling then so from a jurisdictional risk perspective if you're looking for a copper project you want you know my view is you want something in a in the western world because there is a possibility that you're um that you are where you're taking more jurisdictional risk in a country that they is friendlier with with the with the with the china, china russia side uh, or the east is you know there that it's all of a sudden the mining law changes and that asset goes to a chinese group under your under your feet um, and you know, whether that's going to happen or not is, 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 is to be seen. And it depends on, you know, uh, there's varying risks depending on country. I think in, 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 in Africa, you've got to be very cautious, um, um, particularly some of the, the, the rhetoric we've seen, um, Latin America less so depends really country specific there. So yeah, I, you know, the, the Holy grail is a, as a beautiful copper project in, uh, in, in uh in canada so you're talking about critical minerals is the critical mineral thesis or maybe net zero is maybe the better way to, to overarchingly describe it is that catalyst or or that movement is that enough to to um send off the effects of a recession and particularly like metals like copper which are you know mr market or dr copper you know, tells you where the, the market is headed but i guess my question is is are, or is, is that overwhelming catalyst towards you know a greener future can that overcome the effects of what could be you know a dreadful recession i think it depends on your time frame okay i, I think I, I i think dr copper has told you basically told you that a recession is coming if you think about the supply deficits in copper at a, a steady rate copper should be five bucks right now not 330 or 340 or wherever it is right now um so uh, copper is telling you hey there's a recession coming um which i don't think is uh you know, again the most telegraph recession of all time um but the the you know so if you're looking at that critical minerals trade and thinking okay i, I want to get some lithium i want to get some copper i want to get some uranium you know some of those are a little more or less immune to um some of those are more or less immune to th that recession you know uranium's going to be pretty immune just because of the way that that uh that works um you know lithium might be a little bit more immune also because there's a lot of risk capital in 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 lithium so you get a you get a pullback just because you get a, a bit of a risk off trade um you know copper it already seems like the risk capital is out so you know there, there's a you know, you're probably closer to the bottom there than than the top but i think that you know, if you're looking at like you know the next three months, I don't think it overwhelms the the that that net zero trade. If you look at the next year, probably it's what drives us out of the recession, right? What what do governments like to do to end recessions is they like to spend money. Um, although it turns out in 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 booming cycles, they like to spend money too, uh, which is what we're what we've seen um, recently. But that uh, you know that spending. You know the theme is clear what they're going to spend money on it's uh it's going to be infrastructure and um that 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 goal on net zero so i think that that's you know i think in the long term it overwhelms but i think in the short term there's a 
um there are some uh there are some issues right it's it's like a cyclical versus secular right you have a you have a secular trend that is up but you're going to have a in that part of that you're going to have a cyclical you'll have a cyclical drop uh early in the conversation you talked about you know drill holes and you know finding these companies that you know have gone unnoticed but are hitting you know great discovery holes um, on their projects um exploration without a doubt is risky i was wondering your thoughts on prospect generators and whether their ability to de-risk the the risks associated with exploration are worth it i have never made money on a prospect generator i know lots of people who have um so that's not a that's that that's not that's part partially my own bias um where you make money on prospect generators is they get that one project that hits right you, you, if you look at um that was the group that had Tmoc uh, originally um, in Serbia that uh, drilled, and I forget the name of it. But they were pro- they were initially a project reservoir generator. minerals reservoir. Yes, thank you. Um, they were initially a project generator. Found the project that hit, optioned it to the right people. You know, found a major discovery. Um, you know, Orion was a project generator, right? Had a had a you know optioned off projects a lot of his projects found the one that worked finally got the market to pay them to to drill i've made you know i've made a lot of money for shareholders in the process from you know even if in the worst case scenario you, could, you probably could have 10 bagged on that stock even at its current share price um so yeah there are I, I think there is a a model i think the the challenge is is that it depends how pure of a prospect generator you are um in my view um, I think there is a lower risk. Obviously, it reduces your funding risk because you get money for other people. You can keep your people employed by working your projects on behalf of other explorers. But the the flip side or the challenge is, is that if you don't ever find that one home run project, then that you get that exposure to, then you know it it you just kind of keep chugging along. Um, and so that's where I, th- I think prospect generators have that risk is that, you know, in a bear market, they're probably going to do better. In a bull market, they're probably not going to do better unless they're on that discovery. And then in which case you're just on a, you might as well be you're buying an exploration company really. Right. Um, so that's my view on prospect generators. It's it, it. So, you know, but if you trust the team and you trust the, what they're doing and how they're putting it together, I mean, there's his like EMX royalty is a pro, was a prospect generator effectively, right? They, 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 they identify projects, they put them together, they vended them out, they kept a royalty and all of a sudden they have a business, right? Um, so I think that there's, there are success stories. Um, and I think there are opportunities. I think you, just, you, it's how they, how that company approaches it, how they, um, how they stay, you know, what they're doing on their, on their projects. Uh, you know, I, I think prospect generators are afraid to drill are, probably not ones you want to hang around with for a very long time. Uh, moving on to the developers. And so I'll define developers as companies that have an economic study on their project. Um, I think one of the the interesting things that I, I've seen over the course of my investing career is, you know, the, the variation between, you know, big base metal projects and gold projects, in particular, the after-tax IRR and the impact of, you know, let's say the base metal projects, which typically have, or the big ones at least, you know, after tax IRRs under twenty percent, conversely against gold projects, does that twenty percent barrier or does that twenty percent mark mean anything to you when you're investing in a in a company? I, I it's interesting on economic studies and IRRs. Um, you know, having I spent my whole career modeling modeling projects, I still do it to this day. Um, it's you know those IRRs. You know, when you look at a study base value, right? You're not going to sit down and pull the study apart and, and build your own model. You look at those IRRs. The the traditional project metrics, MPV, IRR, do a very poor job of accounting for long life, right? Um, gold projects are typically, you know, five to ten years, right? Oh, we got a five year project, but you you have to have a higher IRR. You have to have a higher return on capital because your your project ends in five years. So you you, you got to make money in that five years for it to to work. So yeah, you got to have a thirty percent or forty percent IRR for it to make sense, right? Uh, even at ten years. But what happens with IRRs is that once you get beyond years eight, nine, ten, you know, having done this, the impact of that incremental cash flow is zero, right? Year eleven doesn't matter. That's why you, forever gold projects were ten years long. Right, everyone. Everyone wanted a ten-year project because that's where the cash flows matter to. They have an impact on the 
on the, the time zero IRR and the time zero uh, MPV. Well, you get beyond that. So, you know, base metal projects, base metal producers, mid tiers and majors, they're looking for somewhere they can go for 20 years, right? They're looking for 20 year mine lines. Well, if you're looking for 20 year mine line, your, your IRR number isn't going to look good because years 10 to 20 don't exist, right? There is value in those years. And, and frankly, it's, it's what, it's the reason you're there because you need to be, you know, base model project is you need to build it. You need to get paid off in the first cycle, first up cycle, tread water in the, in the down cycle, and then make money in, in the third cycle. Right. And that's that. And then, so you need the like longevity to actually make that project ultimately pay. So that's why there, I think there's such a big difference in, in the IRRs between what people consider base battle projects. As an example, HUD Bay, we're talking about you know, the hurdle rate for their Copper World project in Arizona is 15% IR. That said, if it was exceeded 50% IR, but that's a 20 year project on private land in Arizona. They, you're gonna and and there's upside there, right? On, on when you get onto federal land. So yeah, that, that kind of that makes sense. Whereas you know, if you're talking about a seven eight year mine light, it's you got to be much higher on the IR and MPV. Uh, side to justify the investment to say, okay, we might be done in seven years. So, you know, and oftentimes you've looked at these studies too, right? They say, oh, 10 year my life, but like the last three, the last three years are awful, right? They're like, we're, we're not making anybody the last three years, right? Like, so, um, you know, you're going to get to those three years. Now, the assumption is always that you, there's some expiration, you're going to backfill a little bit, but you're making an investment decision based on what facts you have in front of you. You can't, it's hard to make an investment decision and convince the market of it to be like, trust us, we'll we'll, we'll find the find the ore. There are you know, um, there are lots of examples of that. You know, the three year you know, the, the dome is a great example, which is the largest mine and one of the largest mines in Timmins. It had a three year mine like for a hundred years. So, you know, there are examples like that, but you know, the dome was built a hundred years ago with a three year mine life, not today with three year mine life. <laughs> the big difference, and we, well, um, but you gotta have yeah, we sell that. So that's where kind of my view on IR when I look. So, you know, it's it's the, you know, I think for a lot of people, when you look at, you know, those those, those IRR and MPV numbers that you get in a study, like you it, don't don't invest based on the headlines. Like you can't, you got to peel back one layer. What metal prices are they using, right? Are they ridiculous metal prices? Are they reasonable metal prices? You know, also, you know, what... Uh, you know, I mean, you're not going to, the average investor isn't going to be able to look at the CapEx and OpEx numbers and go, okay, those, those make sense. But CapEx numbers, you can, right? Like if you look at a study and go, okay, uh, this project is this size and is in this part of the world. Is there something in that part of the world that has that, um, that same, you know, same size, similar project that would might fit this, um, model. Um, and I think that those are things that like, it's pretty easy to go, okay, it's an open pit mine in Ontario. Okay. The CapEx, you know, and it's 50,000 tons a day. Okay. The CapEx is X. Okay. They're saying the CapEx is X. Is there anything that was built recently that fits that, fits that bill, right? If someone tells you they're building an, an, an 80,000 ton a day mine in Northern Ontario for less than a billion dollars, you know, you just look at Cote and go, okay, Cote is going to be X. So I, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but Cote Tech is going to be north of a billion. Cote is going to be north of a billion dollars by the time it's all said and done. Well, more. And someone tells you some PEA says 900 million. You know, it, it's fantasy. Um, so I think, and that's, you know, the, the, the quick measure for me, and it depends, gold, gold and base metal are different, are different things, right? Like if on a gold project, if I'm looking at it and the, the MPV and the CapEx are the same, which is not a, a financially correct way to look at it like financially correct ways the mpv includes the capex right you're making that money on top but generally speaking what happens is the mpv and the capex are the same you have much higher risk in actually delivering re delivering returns um to the to the shareholders um whereas on base metal projects it might have you know no one's because of that that nature of, of ta the time value of money which is how irr and uh um mpv are calculated you're you lose the last 10 years of the project, but you know, they're, they're trying to establish a camp to go operate in for a lot of these large base metal producers. That MPV to CapEx ratio, I think is an interesting topic, especially the ones that, like you said, that, that ratio of one compared to, you know, ones that have like two and three, 
um, obviously the higher ratio projects are that much more attractive. So in, in what case do you think that a CapEx um, or an MPV to CapEx ratio of, of around one, let's say, works? Like what, what about that company do you think does it have to have some other intangible uh, to make it attractive? I think, you know, I, things you look for is exploration upside or expansion potential, right? It's also who's doing the study, right? If it's, you know, uh, the, the cop world example that I've used a couple times now for, for HUD Bay, that it's close to one on that one, but there it's HUD Bay who's doing the study, right? So they're building the mine. So, you know, studies for studies that we, where you have to build the mine are different where studies where you're hoping to sell the mine, right? It's not a, it's not a marketing document. It's a, someone at HUD Bay signed off on that feasibility study, their jobs on the line if they, if what the project doesn't go according to plan, right? Um, whereas, you know, at Junior XYZ, they have no intention of building the project. The whole purpose of the economic study, the PEA and PEAs in particular, is that they're trying to market the project and say, hey, here's the economic study. It's a marketing document more. So I think that's that's part of it. On um, second is exploration upside or expansion potential. Um, you know, that example of the dome three years ago, three year mine life for a hundred years. If you're into a, a high grade underground mine, the you know that the the opportunity is there but you're you know drilling it off doesn't make sense right you can i think you can start to justify in your head that that's the approach to okay to that that is uh that is okay especially it depends on the margins and how much risk is in it again back to the factors of study and who did it etc um and then yeah i think i think that's it exploration upside who did the study and then what the expansion potential is are the three things where you say, okay, yeah, it's in line, but there's actually there's actually some more here. Also, if they use like like some some companies uh, who don't treat it as a marketing document do themselves a disservice and use really conservative metal prices, right? And then all of a sudden, you know, their their project looks terrible, even though they've just you know they've taken the, a very conservative part of metal prices, which probably is prudent, and you can put in any deck you want, and they'll show you that upside number. But I think that's the other the other thing that peeling back that one layer of Okay, this is what's this is what's underneath. Uh, talking about future cash flows, I, you know, I think you know, looking back to 2020, uh, it was it was one of the only years that uh, I can remember where the oil price really took a step back, and I think free cash flow really increased for the mining companies um, against that oil price, which kind of proliferated into all the other costs. You know, looking forward with inflation, you know, probably being uh, a, an issue. Do you see? free cash flows, let's say for the gold companies increasing, or do you think everything is just going to move up incrementally and free cash flows are, are basically going to stay at a, at a kind of set differential? At $1,900 gold, um, if you're not making money as a producer, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> um, so the I would argue that you know a lot of them have, have that baked in. Um, the smart ones probably have hedged out some of their oil exposure um, lower down. The what I would say is, though, is that there's is very interesting. Um, I think the biggest the energy and people are the two biggest costs in mining, and they vary depending on the jurisdiction, depending on the type of mine, right? So if you're running a large open pit mine like a Detroit Lake or Canadian Malarctic, oil has a, is, your, is your biggest cost input, right? So when the oil price runs, you have a you have a significant margin compression as uh, as as part of that, right? So you know. If oil went all of a sudden it was a buck twenty a barrel versus ninety, I think I saw JP Morgan's calling for an upside case of one hundred and fifty or something, right? Um, but like, yeah, they're they're going to see significant margin compression. The, whereas your underground miners, um, obviously in the same family, like a Laurent or a um, in the same in the same company, they're not going to see that same margin compression, right? They're going to see th theirs is more based on wages. Um, now with Long, long, persistent inflation. You are going to get pressure on wages. We're seeing the the um, the UAW uh, talks with uh, in the U.S. Right, and they're 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 pushing for a substantial wage increase. Um, I haven't checked it today, so they might have gotten it already. But anyways, but they're, they're pushing for a substantial wage increase, and that really affects your underground miners, your large underground mines. Um, if you have both going up, it's bad for everybody. But again, at nineteen hundred dollar gold. You're you're doing it wrong. It also depends on jurisdiction. This is the other part that I, I think that it was a part the point that was brought up at the gold forum and at, at the Denver gold uh, gold forum 
um, or just Gold Forum Americas put on by the Denver Gold Group. Uh, just make sure I say the name right. The, uh, you know, gold in U.S. dollars is is really well priced, but gold in every other currency is pretty spectacular. And, and we're going to get to the point where we're going to push all time highs if the dollar starts to run. Um, so I think that there's a uh, th- there's an opportunity there where you go, okay, well, you know, if you're again use those same examples, right? The only thing that's really priced in U.S. dollars consistently is um, oil, steel to some extent, but that's a lesser input is oil. So, in an event where um, uh, we get a, a run in the in the U.S. dollar and you get the you know you get pressure with oil price going up, um, you know. Your labor, if you're a Canadian underground miner, your labor is priced in Canadian dollars. Even though it's gone up, it's pro- it potentially has gone up less than the currency's devalue. And it's what we saw in, in um, 2015, 2014, 2015, the, it was the small Canadian miners that all got taken out, right? It was the the Claude, Claude Resources, Lakeshore Gold, and Kirkland Lake acquired something and then had a massive, massive run on the back of that. But they were those companies were minting much better cash flows than say their US counterparts simply because they were they were off a lot of their their underground operating costs were in Canadian dollars. So you've got this you got this uh lift uh based on that and because labor becomes such a huge part in your your cost stack in an underground mine. Right. Yeah, it's gonna be an interesting next few years <laughs> as we move through this and see see how it all uh works out. Uh, Derek, can you leave us with a couple words on Gold Seventy Nine and all of Resource? What does the rest of the year look like, and, and can you give us perspective on twenty twenty four? Yeah, so for Gold Seventy Nine, um, we're you know, we actually had some really good exploration success this year. Um, so the boat drill holes that are recognized, we hit nine meters at uh, fifty one grams at our uh, Gold Chain project in Arizona. Um, we're looking at some, you know, with markets being tough, we're looking at some low cost exploration options to keep moving that project ahead. Uh, but you know, we're being very prudent with our capital simply because it, you know, replacing it right now as a, you know, as a small, small cap junior miner is very difficult at all of, um, as I said, you know, our, our, our big win this year is that we, we, we sold Rockcliff metals. So Rockcliff was 50% of our assets and we owned over 20% of the company. So there was the only exit was a, was a transaction for us. Um, sold that to HUD Bay. Um, and so, you know, we think that from there, we are coming into liquidity at the right time, uh, as a company. In fact, as of right now, we have enough cash on HUD base shares on hand to cover our current market cap because we traded a discount to NAV. Um, and so, you know, what we're doing and, and, and you know, what a lot of this conversation was about is we're looking to prudently deploy that capital um, into opportunities. And I think there's an opportunity for us to generate some significant returns. You know, this is the first time when we took over all of, we were about 10% liquid. Um, it took us a long time to get to sort of being where we are and to be 50 to 60% liquid. Um, and so that's, uh, that's, that's the opportunity. We're obviously looking at different ways to grow that business. Cause obviously it's undersized about $9 million in asset on assets, but, uh, the, there's an opportunity here to, to grow it with performance based on sort of, as we've said, we're closer to the bottom and the top. So then there are some real market dislocation opportunities in, out there. Excellent. Derek, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for being on with us. Thanks for having me on, Brian. I really enjoyed it. Talk to you soon.